My, uh, my lesson tonight is entitled, No Fear. The reason I, I titled that uh, is because of a phenomenon that I've noticed uh, taking place. I've noticed a trend in uh, television and movies, um, and that is the, the marriage of the occult and science fiction or uh, comedy um, in, one, in one program, in one movie, in one you know, TV series. You know, there was a time when the various characters and beliefs of the occult, such as witches and demons and fortune telling, so on and so forth, these things were relegated to scary movies. They were horror movies or scary movies. And the occult was seen as something bad, something evil, and it had to be combated. And that was the, usually the nature of the movie, you know, good versus evil. But a little switch took place a while back. Today, more and more, we see the mixing of the occult concepts and personalities with mainstream shows. As a matter of fact, they have become the heroes in many of today's pop culture um, uh, stories and media, so on and so forth. You know, Harry Potter movies of a few years ago, the Twilight books and movies. You got good vampires, you got bad vampires. You got good witches, you got bad witches. You know? and, and sometimes you've got good witches uh, who are taking care of, of people. In other words, people are depending on good witches and good vampires to have a good life. Of course, the concern here is that with acceptance of this kind of sanitized form of occultism, we're providing a gateway to more serious and dangerous forms of occult practice. I know it's an old argument, you know, the slippery slope, but the reason that it's an old argument is that it's a, a very valid argument. You know, the first step towards something begins with the first step and sometimes the second step. And what I've noticed in the world is, uh, in the world, we will take something that is unacceptable and sinful and simply change the name of it to make it acceptable. You know, there was a time when something was called abortion. Now it's called what? Choice. There was a time when something was called homosexuality. Now it's called uh, civil rights. So we just change things around, give it a different name, make it sanitized, and then people here will accept it. Well, in the same way, the, 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 the pot usually leads, uh, in the same way that you know, pot and those type of soft drugs lead to hard drugs, people who play and people who watch, people who accept the idea of socially acceptable occultism can lead in many times to um, uh, the acceptance of practices which are uh, dangerous. Uh, and they're dangerous, I'll tell you why, because they're condemned by God. Galatians chapter 5, verse 20. Now one problem that the occult produces is fear. In the old days, back in the day, when you know, anything occult was dark and evil, so on and so forth, usually what it did is it produced fear in people. Fear of the unknown, fear of the dreadful view of that the occult uh, has of spiritual life. The occult presents spiritual life in another way. What I'm trying to get across is there was a time when occultis, uh, occultism in movies and books presented um, uh, a view of life that was frightening. But today what we've done, uh, what screenwriters and authors and so on and so forth, what they've done is they've taken occultism and they've given it a positive view, almost a desirable view, made heroes out of these, out of these uh, individual. And this is especially true of, uh, of developing nations, you know, where occult is still something in the darkness. Only here in the United States do we take something that was formerly bad and we make it good and so on and so forth. In many other countries, in other third world countries, occultism is still evil, still dark, and still something that produces fear and, and ignorance. Uh, you know, uh, Marty and family went to Haiti, and I've been to Haiti, and I know a lot of people are in Haiti, and if you're there any time at all, you find out that people still do believe in occult practices, and they practice these things, and it's something that creates fear and confusion. People who practice voodoo and witchcraft are intimidated or rather intimidate others 
with their evil practices. You know, I think we're familiar with Old Testament passages like Deuteronomy chapter 18 that forbid these ancient practices and they name them, they give them names. If you have your Bibles, go over to Deuteronomy chapter 18. I'd like you to read that passage with me. Deuteronomy chapter 18, beginning in verse 10, says the following, for example, never sacrifice your son or daughter as a burnt offering and do not let your people practice fortune telling or use sorcery or interpret omens or engage in witchcraft or cast spells or function as mediums or psychics or call forth the spirits of the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. It is because uh, the other nations have done these detestable things that the Lord your God will drive them out ahead of you. Two things there, one, you know, he's naming names there, he's saying the practices that he despises but you notice he says the reason that the nations are being driven out of the land that was eventually given to the Israelites is because they practice these very things. And I don't know about you, but you know, if you go back over it, wait a minute, he says, don't let your people practice. Now watch, watch. He says, uh, uh, fortune telling, sorcery, uh, engage in witchcraft, cast spells, function as mediums, psychics, or call forth the spirits of the dead. Wait a minute. Are those the themes for Hollywood movies? Or is this something that you know, God has given in the Old Testament? Well, you know what? They're both. <laughs> They're what God warns against and finds detestable in the Old Testament and they're subject of books and movies and TV series in mainstream media today. Same thing. As I said before, Paul the Apostle reiterates this prohibition in Galatians 5.20. Someone would say, oh, well that was the Old Testament and that was a different time, you know, we're modern now, we, we don't really believe they're witches, you know. it's not the point. Paul says in Galatians 5.20, you know, he, he says these people will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. He talks about sorcery. And he talks about the fact that sorcery is a deed of the flesh. So we know it's forbidden, but the question I get the most is does it have any power and am I susceptible to its power? So I don't want to go on for 25 minutes talking about you know, this is a sin, you ought not to do it. I don't need 25 minutes to tell you that. I just have to read Deuteronomy 18 and you know, enough said. And maybe a warning against not being seduced into a sanitized version of what God has called detestable. Because yeah, it's true, the stories are fun, the, the graphics are great, you know, so on and so forth, but it still is what it is. So I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about the idea, does it have any power? Does it have any power today in our lives? That's what I want to talk about. Well, in the book of Numbers, there's an interesting episode where an enemy of God's people named Balak hired a prophet and a practitioner of the occult named Balaam. So you have to, I'm going to repeat these names often. So it's Balak and Balaam. Balak is the king, the one who you know, wants Balaam the prophet to you know, harm God's people. He wanted Balaam to put a curse on the people. He was afraid that these people from Israel in the desert would come into his land, overrun his territory. And so he thought that Balaam's magic could somehow defeat them. Now it's a long story, but in the middle of his negotiations with the king, Balaam reviews this message from God. He says, you know what, I've been thinking about what you've asked me to do, curse the people of God, and this is the message I've got for you from God. God says, God brings them out of Egypt. He is for them like the horns of a wild ox, for there is no omen against Jacob, nor is there any divination against Jacob. Israel, Numbers 23, 22 and 23, you see a little bit of that uh, literary feature there called parallelism. He says the same things twice in two ways. For example, he said, no omen. There's no occult power against, that'll work against Jacob. 
nor is there any divination, same thing, against Israel. So eventually, Balak gave up trying to get Balaam to curse the people because it just was not allowed by God. Now this brief passage does give us some insights into the spiritual principles that govern the workings of the spiritual underworld. You know, we, we say it over and over again, this is not the only world, right? The physical world, it's one world, it's a real world, but there are other real world dimensions, right? The underworld, what does Paul say? Our fight is against what? Our fight is it against physical flesh and blood? No, he says, our fight is against spiritual beings and dominions and powers and high, in other words, it's in the spiritual world, that's where the fight is going on. So there are principles that govern that world. And I want to share some with you. First of all, the occult practices that I've talked about here do have certain power. So as a Christian, don't you ever be arguing against someone by saying to them, ah, occultism, nothing to it, it's just voodoo, nothing to it, no power whatsoever. That's not correct. Balaam, had to be stopped in what he was to do. He apparently had done it before. We know that Satan has certain, not infinite, but certain power that is seen in the negative actions of the world. The occult is an effort to tap into this power, whether people are aware of it or not. That's what the occult is, that's what magic is all about trying to manipulate the powers in the spiritual world so that they will work on your behalf in this world. And all kinds of ways of doing that, omens and you know, curses and recipes and so on and so forth. Evil does not exist in a vacuum. The Bible describes how Satan used nations and leaders to try to destroy the church. If you're thinking that there's no power, think about the things that Satan has done to this world and the power that lies behind it. He tried to tempt Jesus. He led Judas to betray his Lord. He wanted to destroy Peter and he would have done it without Jesus' interaction. So it's naive to say that there is no power in witchcraft or the occult. There is power, but it is Satan's power and it is limited power. And so don't be fooled by those who say that you know, being a good witch or being a good sorcerer, you know, this kind of power must come from God. That this is a godly thing. No, it's not. If it's a sorcerer or a vampire, that's not a godly thing. Those are things from below, my friend. People say, well, it's just for fun. Well, all right. You want to play with that kind of fire for fun, you might get hurt. If you read in Revelation chapter 21, verse eight, John, said the, uh, John writes the following, he says, but coward, this is, this is the Lord speaking, he says, but cowards, we know what a coward is, and unbelievers, we know what unbelievers are, and he says the corrupt, we know who they are, and murderers, that's easy to understand, and the immoral, you know, sexual immorality, okay, we get all of that, don't need, a, you know, don't need a PhD to figure out what that is. And then he says, and those who practice witchcraft, and those who practice witchcraft, an idol worshiper and all liars. Notice, and those who practice witchcraft are lumped in with all of those others, those murderers and those liars and those who are sexually immoral. And what does he say about them? Listen, he says, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second, this is the second death. So if you think it's not important, if you think there's nothing to it, and it's just a little thing, then why would God say that, 
witchcraft and those who practice these occult things will be condemned to the lake of fire. It seems that God takes it seriously. We're the ones who don't take it seriously. And you know why? Because we've been numbed. Because we've been numbed by a, by a tidal wave of media and stories and images that just we drown in this stuff day after day after day to the point where we're not sensitive anymore to what is actually evil, or we're not sensitive anymore to where this stuff comes from. You know, just ask yourself, you know, where does this stuff come from? Does it come from above or does it come from below? Usually you get a pretty quick answer to that, to that question. Another rule that I want to talk about as far as the occult is concerned, and that is, the occult has power, but it does not have power over Christians. You know, just as God protected the Israelites from Balaam's curse, He protects all of His children in the very same way. The principle is reaffirmed in the epistle of 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. What does He say? Jesus says, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Well, who is he that is in you? Well, that's the Holy Spirit that's in you. He says the Holy Spirit in you is greater than who? He who is in the world. Well, who's the he, Elvis? <laughs> no, the he that is in the world is Satan. And all that Satan does in the world. He says the one that's in you is more powerful than the one who is in the world. The power that's in you is greater than the power that's, that's in the world. Paul tells us that there is a battle waged in the spiritual realm where the real enemy, which is the enemy of the soul, resides. He also says that we are perfectly equipped as Christians to protect, to resist, and to fend off these, these attacks. What does he say in Ephesians 6? Familiar passage. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Do you think that one of the schemes of the devil is to seduce you into thinking that things that are evil are okay? Do you think that might be one of his schemes? I would say for everybody here tonight, I don't think the devil could seduce you into committing premeditated murder. And I don't think the devil could seduce you into standing up and saying, I hate God and I hate, you know, I don't think he could seduce you into doing that. But I think he could seduce any one of us into thinking that something that God has said is detestable and seduce us into thinking, well, maybe it's not so detestable. Maybe it's okay. He certainly has done that in the last 50 to 100 years on the subject of homosexuality, hasn't he? He seduced this nation into thinking, well, not only is it okay, it's something worthy of praise. Can you imagine that? When the leaders of our nation defend something that God has called an abomination, So don't hesitate for a moment to think that Satan doesn't have the power of seduction on his side. For our struggle, Paul says, is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. We need to remember that there is a battle going on. And it's fought on that level. America may be the most powerful nation in history militarily. Militarily, I'm, I'm convinced that we could take on any nation in the world and reduce it to rubble in not very long. That's how powerful our military is. But we're not that strong spiritually. And that might seem like a blanket statement, but we're not that strong spiritually. Why do I know? 
I look around and see how we have been seduced as a nation into calling things that were once called detestable and evil by God in plain black and white, and now we champion these things. Our highest courts champion things that were deemed evil by God. So we shouldn't worry about things like witchcraft and ghosts and voodoos and spells and curses and the like overcoming us as Christians. I worry about the world, but I don't worry about us because God specifically protects us and provides for us so that these things will not hurt us. So as much as I warn against these things, I'm confident that those who remain faithful to God and true to His word and use His word as a light to guide their way and their thinking, I am assured that we will not stumble if we stay with the power that is within us and follow the power that leads us. And then one other thing, another spiritual principle, and that is that God's word is more powerful than any occult power or practice. In the encounter between Balaam and the children of Israel, we read that the prophet could do nothing, nothing bad, actually nothing good either, without God's permission and God's word. God's word, the Bible says, is powerful. God likens it to a sword, which was the most lethal weapon of its day. And he says that the sword, or the word, is the sword of the spirit, Ephesians 6, 17. The way that the spirit protects us is with the sword of the spirit, his word. Why do you, why do you come to church? Why do I preach? because we want to learn how to protect ourselves with the sword. The word is sharper than any two-edged sword. In other words, it can define precisely what is right and what is wrong, what is true and what is false. It can, it can, it can give us insight into those things. It enables us not to be seduced. And the word is also the sword that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. In other words, the source of this power is Jesus Christ. The words that protect us are the words of Jesus, Jesus Christ. And this sword, this word has great power and ability beyond the power and the ability of the forces of darkness. The word has the power to reveal the truth to us. You know, Jesus said, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 7. The problem is that the force of darkness has a much bigger platform to promote its lies than the platform for the truth. You know, Hal and I this morning, we were at Ridgecrest and we were uh, presenting our Bible talk uh, program to that particular congregation who have agreed to uh, provide support for this. And I was saying to them, you know what, uh, this, this singer, uh, Miley Cyrus, you know, we're talking about the internet and uh, communication. And I said, here this little 20 year old girl, she can run around half naked and, 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 you know, uh, and, and what happens? She makes $150 million this year. And a million people will go on her website to, to watch what is, what in my opinion is simply soft porn. That's all it is. She's lying on a bed half naked, doing all kinds of sensual things. I mean, it's, it's just soft porn. And she's paid for it. She's interviewed by newspapers. The coverage is worldwide. Anywhere in the world where she goes, she'll fill a stadium full of people for her songs and her, quote, act. And the world just can't get enough of her. 
But the rest of us, missionaries, preachers, we have to scrounge around for dollars to be able to have a platform so that we can preach the gospel to the world. You see the, hmm, see the problem there? We're confident that the word has much greater power than anything else. What we're trying to do is to get a big enough platform to be able to reach as many people as we can. No tricks, no gimmicks, just God's word being preached. The word has the power to teach us and correct us and judge us and train us for living a right and fruitful life before God. 2 Timothy 3, 16. The word has the power to save us from condemnation and eternal death. Paul tells us the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe, Romans 1, 16. Yes, there is power in the dark sciences. There is power in magic and the occult practiced by many, but it cannot stand in the face of God's power expressed in His word and available to everyone. God's word is not secret like the occult is. It's open and He wants everyone to be exposed to it. And so the power wielded by the occult is the power of fear. And people try to deal with their fears in many ways, usually by trying to use magic and superstition. You know, my lucky this and my lucky that. What is that? That's just, that's magic. The only power that can defeat the power of the occult is God's power in His word. And the only power that can calm our fears especially the three things that cause most of our fears and worry is God's word. So let me kind of leave off the idea of the occult and so on and so forth and just talk about this fear idea. God's word deals with our basic fears. For example, God's word calms our fear of the spirit world. Occultism is simply man's effort to try to control or make sense in some way, shape, or form of the spirit world which he does not see or understand. But the word of God calms our fear of the unknown spirit world by revealing to us that Jesus Christ is the Lord of that dimension. I feel a whole lot better, even if I don't understand everything about the spirit world, I feel a whole lot better about it knowing that Jesus Christ is the Lord of that place. For by Him all things were created both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created by Him and for Him, Colossians 1.16. Whatever is out there that we cannot see, Jesus is over it. So I don't have to understand everything. I don't have to know everything that goes on in the spirit world. Because God's word tells me that my Lord is Lord of that place. And one day I will know but I'm not afraid of it anymore. God's word calms our fear of death. You know, the word reveals to us why we die and how we can avoid dying and being punished forever for sin. Paul says the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord, Romans 6, 23. You see, it doesn't matter when we die or what we die of, everybody will die because everyone is a sinner. I'm always kind of surprised when people are shocked that somebody died. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not making light of it, but they're shocked. And the question is, well, did you not think your 97-year-old mother was going to die one day? She, they say, she died, oh, I can't believe she died. Uh, she was 97. What did you think she was going to do? 
The word promises us that those who die in Christ will enter into the eternal life promised to us with God. The word not only promises this, but it also describes how Jesus obtained this blessing for us through His own death for our sins and His resurrection as a guarantee for our own. Do you know why communion is so encouraging every week? It reminds me of one thing in particular. It reminds me of the fact that if he could do it, I can do it. He did it to demonstrate that he could do it and then he promised me that he would do it for me. The communion is not a chore, it's not a, a duty. It's a marvelous reminder to me of the promise because you know what? From one Sunday to another Sunday, a lot of stuff happens. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And sometimes it's a lot of bad stuff that happens. And by Saturday night, sometimes I'm not feeling so positive about this world and so positive about myself because a lot of times the bad stuff, I've caused it. By saying or thinking or doing something I shouldn't be doing. And then come Sunday I remember, oh yeah, now I remember. I get to go to heaven. I get to go to heaven. The occult power claims to bring the dead back as vampire and zombies. Really? God's word brings back the dead through resurrection and glory to an eternal joyful existence with God. Okay, which, which do you want? You want to be the vampire that lives forever or do you want to be a child of God, never again reminded of sin or death? And then finally, the word of God calms our fear of the future. The word calms our fears concerning the future by revealing the ultimate future. I'm no prophet, but I know what's going to happen in the future. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, in the first chapter, and then in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, and in 2 Peter 3, to, uh, chapter 3, verses 3 to 13, these two apostles provide the scenario for the future when the world as we know it will end. I know what the future is. This is the future, according to Peter and Paul. Everything will be going along as usual in the world in its normal cycle, when there will be a decided turn for the worse as the ideological and philosophical and moral pendulum swings severely towards ungodliness and apostasy. When this happens, the Bible says that God will reveal the man of lawlessness to the faithful. And some people say, oh, I'm nervous. Who's going to be the man of lawlessness? Will I, will I recognize him? Will I know? The Bible says that God will reveal it. What does that mean? He's going to tell Christians who that person is. Don't worry about it. You'll know. And then Jesus will return with a trumpet and a shout and then the dead will resurrect with the unbelievers and the unfaithful to judgment in hell and the faithful to be with the Lord in the air. And the creation will be destroyed with intense heat and the new heavens and the new earth will appear as an eternal dwelling place for the saints to be with God in Christ. And here it is. And all of this will take place in the twinkling of an eye. In the twinkling of an eye. It'll all happen. Once we know, once we are assured of these things, there's no need to fear. God will provide all we need until and on this day as well. Yes, there is death in our future, but there is also eternal life through Jesus Christ. No need to be afraid. So whether it be fear caused by the occult, or the simple anxiety that comes from being a weak human being, I invite those struggling with these issues to come to Christ in repentance 
And bury, you know we say we bury our sins, but we also bury our fears in the waters of baptism. One of the first things I remember when I was baptized many, many years ago, coming out of the water and then you know, after I was changing you know, and getting my clothes on, the thought struck me, <laughs> I'm going to heaven. <laughs> I'm going to heaven. I'm absolutely sure I'm going to heaven. It says there right here in black and white, I'm going to heaven. And the major struggle in my life has been that the evil one has tried to convince me that that's not true. That I wasn't going to make it, that I was just dreaming things, that are you kidding me, you're going to make it, you? Mr. Big Mouth, no way, you're never going to make it. And I invite those who've wandered away from Christ, if you've been unfaithful, receive the prayer of restoration that the elders can pray over you. And for all of us, let's give up all attempts to deal with fear without Christ's help. And let's surrender our fear to Him now. If you have any need to come forward, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. He who receives you is anxious to receive you, to forgive you, and to give you the assurance that one day, you and I, we're going to go to heaven. No fear there. <laughs>